Hello, Dr. Lightman. Hello, everyone. Today we got to Abraham, and he'll stay with us for quite some time. And we've already discussed that at this level of egoism, a person has the first aspiration towards the Creator, and Abraham's leading us. So it says in the book of Midrash Rabbah. This book was written a few thousands of years ago during the Exodus from Babylon. There's a very specific kind of attitude towards it. It's written in a very peculiar way. And that's why this general attitude towards it. It's written in a literary style. Right. It describes both earthly and, at the same time, heavenly actions. And this intermingled style in which it's written is intended, meant for a person for whom all of it was just one entire world, one manifestation. And to us it sounds kind of strange, of course. And the book is also partially seen as a legend. It's like Pushkin's story where he says that thy horse shall be thy death and so on. Something that's half realistic. And it's the same here. The story about Abraham begins like a thriller. What exactly happened there? The name quite explains it. The portion is called Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha, that's in Hebrew. And what is its translation? What does it literally mean? It means go, go, like get out of here. Yeah, and this can be interpreted in a very crude or in a very soft and gentle way. What would be the crude interpretation? Get out of here. Also, get lost, scram, and it's truly so. Leave that egoistic world kingdom in which you have revealed yourself, because this is what's revealed to Abraham in ancient Babylon. So the Creator tells him, go, go, get out of here. Yes, get out of here and leave this egoistic desire for another desire. Based on what I will reveal to you now, you will achieve the exodus into a new spiritual and divine desire, the desire of bestowal and love. The chapter is all about ascending. In the meantime, I wanted to tell a bit about Abraham before starting this chapter. It says in the Great Commentary, at that time, King Nimrod reigned in Babylon. Yes, it is written about that time. The strength and deceit of King Nimrod were to a proverb. It was universal knowledge that his arm aimed at a deer's heart never missed its heart. Woe to him who dared doubt that Nimrod was a self-created god. An executioner always stood next to his throne. What is it all about? By the way, this in fact the image of a real king. A king is a person who, first of all, is feared. When we talk about having the properties of the Creator, we also say that, first of all, this is the property of fear. Ah, yir'a in Hebrew. Ah, only it's called so in relation to the Creator, because we perceive His greatness. We don't fear His threats, but we're in awe of His greatness. And hence, this fear is called awe. This awe stems out of respect, out of great revelation of this great force, of this great fulfillment, universal governance. Meaning that I don't fear, but awe the Creator. Yes, these are a bit different things, obviously. And then we attain love. It's the same in corporeality, too. But, as we're egoists, it acts upon us differently. The king has to treat us harshly, cruelly, causing in us fear and anxiety, awe, up to horror of his power. Our life is in his hands, without any conditions, without any laws, without any logic. He can do anything he wants. Then, at the peak of this, fear appears love. That's surprising. Yes, it stems from our egoistic desire. The feeling towards the Creator stems from a gradual transformation of desire to an altruistic state, and then it comes to awe and to open love. 
It doesn't even matter what happens, and even if in my eyes he will not be king, I will love him in all of his manifestations. But here everything holds only on the fact that there is an executioner next to him. An executioner stood next to him, it also says so about the times of Stalin as well. Actually, someone who wants to be king, this is how he has to be. In our world, if you take for example, Tamerlan, Genghis Khan, that's how they were. A king is not a king if he doesn't chop off, let's say, a couple of dozens of his men's heads. And for no reason, by the way, not because he's so righteous or something. On the contrary, there should be no justice. There should be only the will of the king. That's it. So what is this about, actually? It's not talking about this, right? It's talking about the king that rules inside of us, Nimrod, as our egoistic I. This egoism actually shows its complete irrationality. It eats up and consumes simply everything, forcing me to do who knows what in order to govern the rest of the world, even though that possibly I know that it's to my detriment. So who is King Nimrod? It's our egoism, which forces us to keep on fighting and doesn't give us rest. And this is a problem, and I still can't do anything. I'm still afraid of its manifestation, and therefore I start loving it. My ego? Yes. On this hatred, on this fear, appears love. But it lasts, of course, as long as there is an executioner next to it. And there came different times, and it says about it. One day, Nimrod's astrologists humbly approached the throne and fell on their knees before the king. Your majesty, they announced, we have become aware of a grave danger threatening your throne. The stars predict that a boy will be soon born in your kingdom. He will deny your divinity and will overcome you. It's like the beginning of a thriller. This means that in the egoistic kingdom that's based on man's complete egoism that works only for itself, and it seems so to him that it's only for himself, suddenly he has this insight, this little boy, this new attainment, understanding that will reveal to him that Nimrod is worthless. Even in this state where he's small and weak, with just one word of his, because all the desires grew already, they're satiated with the ego, they're convinced that it leads them nowhere, it just rules them, and that this is what it's all about, that this is its quality. Meaning, it doesn't lead to anything. And then comes this little child that reveals that the king is naked. And of course, this brings Nimrod down. When does the time come for this boy? when the egoism reaches its greatness, maturity. And the astrologers are those properties that sort of help this egoism to manifest itself somehow, correctly. Because the egoism itself is very dumb. It only has a single thought. This is good. It doesn't understand any consequences. It sees no consequences of actions. And it does not take into account any other forces that exist in nature. These helpers are not so blinded by their egoism. They carry more reasonable, balanced properties in a person, which are in an intermediate state between this great egoistic desire and understanding, awareness, knowledge, wisdom. On the one hand, this is why they're not like the king. They're wiser. But this is due to the fact that they're less egoistic. And therefore they can anticipate this great threat. Yes. So this is what it says about that boy. Abraham was about to be born. And it's necessary that Nimrod would know about this. Because otherwise Abraham will not grow to be Abraham. He must grow in persecution, in exile. We see the same with Moses, and then it happens with everyone. Any growth occurs in a state of exile, in a state of pressure, persecution. What does Nimrod do? He says, I will issue a decree ordering to build special houses where all pregnant women will be held. We shall then make sure that only the baby girls will be kept alive. Terach, one of the most honored noblemen at the court, was present during the discussion and jokingly asked, You do not expect to hold my wife in one of these buildings, do you? 
Terach, he's a close advisor to Nimrod. He's an astrologer. He's a wizard. He predicts everything that's good for the egoism. He's a guide, a leader of egoism in this great kingdom. Nimrod knows that thanks to Terach, he lives and flourishes. and Therefore, he should meet him halfway. And soon, his son Abraham will be born. If he'll show Nimrod that he doesn't trust him, then why does he listen to him at all? Meaning that there should be complete trust between Nimrod and Terach. Terach is like the next step, a more forward-looking one than Nimrod. He's an ideologist versus Nimrod, who's more practical. Yes. What are these houses? It's written that all boys shall be killed and only the baby girls shall be kept alive. It reminds us of Pharaoh, who said the same thing about midwives, how Moses was then found as the only one saved from execution. All infants were killed, but only Moses survived. The same you have here. All infants were destroyed, except for Abraham, who was saved and stayed, meaning of all those desires that were born in the process of growth and development, there's just one desire that is correct. Therefore, a person must choose it. I can choose only one desire with my egoism, and with its help, I can advance to the goal. My egoism wants to destroy this desire. Therefore, there should be a subconscious, internal development in myself, independently of me. It grows and manifests, and then I can't do anything about it. Meaning that there are such qualities in us that must grow, despite and independently of us, without being perceived by us. And yet again, I'm asking, what does it mean that only girls lived and boys had to be killed? Desires remain, new intentions are destroyed. So girls are the desire. Yes, the desire, lack, doesn't matter which word you use. Nukva in Hebrew comes from the word nekev, vessel, and the boys are the fulfillment. Yes, it's the property of fulfillment, how to fulfill. Each one fulfills in his own way. Therefore, we don't need any other new fulfillments. We just need this old system, and with this doctrine, we advance forward. Let's fulfill the ego. You provide more ego, and I know how to fulfill it. This Nimrod. Okay, then the following happens. Terach hides his son in a cave. And when Abraham is three years old, he suddenly starts looking around, looking at the world, and he suddenly begins to feel that behind all of this, there is a force, meaning Abraham at the age of three attains the creator. So my first question is, what does it mean these three years somewhere in a cave? What kind of attainment is it? Abraham and a person, a three-year-old that attains the creator, what is that? meaning that he begins to perceive that all good and all bad. The first year is like in Egypt, where we talk about that at first there's the seven years of plenty and then the seven years of famine, and then appears the middle line that brings them to the exodus from Egypt and ascent. Same thing here. The first year, simply understanding the world. The second year is understanding its egoistic fulfillment, the right and the left lines. And the third year is the perception of its internal concepts, the inner driving force, meaning the third year leads them to attain the Creator. In our world, there are two reigns, the positive and negative forces that govern this world and who governs him. So the third year, the third part, is the middle line from which these two forces originate. Abraham reaches this state, and of course, we're not talking about a three-year-old child, but at the age of 37, he started acting, taking action, etc. Then, when he was about to have a baby born, he's already a hundred years old, etc. Meaning that all these are the heights and measurements of attainment. Three years, seven years, ten years, thirty, forty, and so on, up to a hundred and to a hundred and twenty, etc. Meaning that they are measurements of his control over the ego and the nature of the universe. 
and the understanding of how it works and how he has to take the reins from the Creator into his own hands. So, for a person who attains the spiritual world, these three years are the three steps of development. Yeah, three years, or three steps, or the three days, or like in Egypt, you have the seven years and seven years, and during the Exodus, it manifests in plagues, etc. Okay, then it says that Nimrod sort of forgot a little about Abraham. Abraham is a boy who has already attained the Creator. This is because this is how a person develops, that at any given step he gets used to that level and thinks that everything will continue like before. So Abraham returned to his father, Terach, and started working in his shop, selling idols. Yes, spiritual advancement begins, first of all, in a state where a person's guided by his ego. He's still under the control of Terach in some way, he absorbs knowledge from Terach that guides him, meaning, what did he learn? He takes from his father, Terach, all of his knowledge, techniques, how to cope with life, with the ego, etc. He learns all this, up to the point where he becomes equal to him and the egoistic use of this world meaning that you cannot begin your spiritual advancement before all the egoism is in your power. You understand its essence and you can control it. This is what Abraham reaches. When can you control the ego? When you feel that it's bad for you. The ego meaning, no, 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 not at first. Abraham works for his father. He makes these statues, amulets, idols, he sells them, meaning that he earns egoistically on seemingly spiritual attainment. People believe that he has a connection with spiritual forces, meaning that this force in our body and our spiritual entity is a force that's leading him forward. And at this stage, we believe that we can succeed in our world by attaining the spiritual world meaning that this all happens egoistically. But this is already an egoistic spiritual growth, meaning that at first we cared only for primitive life, like Nimrod. Then we started to think, why? We can, first of all, make our primitive earthly life much easier if we attract the upper forces to it meaning that we use them for ourselves. Of course, to draw from above down, we'll be healthier, more successful, we'll know what the tomorrow holds. Who wouldn't want to know and understand everything? Meaning, let the spiritual world serve me. Of course, knowledge is power. Then a person begins to understand that these forces and the very existence in the field of these upper forces that it's good in and of itself, it's perfection, infinity, disconnected from this animate body, this animate life. To the contrary, you needn't pull spirituality here, but to raise yourself to spirituality. That's where the real life is. Why take something from there to this petty existence of mine? better I myself will get out of this existence into the upper world. And this transformation is what happens to Abraham. It's a revolutionary idea, right? Yes, and it happens gradually, and so it is to this day. A person comes to us because he feels bad in this life, and he thinks that with the help of Kabbalah, he can improve it, make it better. And we welcome this desire. It's healthy, realistic. Please, everything's for you. Everything's open, but when he begins to study Kabbalah, and we don't hide this, by the way, we don't. And this is what catches everyone. And this is how it is in nature, that a person can't come to it in any other way. No matter how much you tell him, he doesn't believe it. He simply has no other way out. He understands that there are forces here that govern him, so he at least tries to somehow control them. And after a while, a spiritual revolution occurs in him. Why should I do anything in this life? Somehow make it slightly better, something, improve it, make some cosmetic changes. Why would I if I can rise to some great attainments of the Creator 
and to exist there in my perfect and eternal existence. And here nothing's eternal or perfect, but it's just to try and avoid some problems. Naturally, a person begins to egoistically choose the spiritual over the material. But when he chooses the spiritual, he begins to aspire to the spiritual because being there, separated from the material, is the best thing. And he also comes to the understanding that the spiritual isn't in order to make him feel better, but in and of itself it's so valuable, and this is gradually revealed to him. So we talked about three degrees. The first is to draw, it's also not the first, before that we exist like animals in this world, on the level of Nimrod. Yeah, we watch TV and so on, and then I have a desire to spice up my life a bit, and then disappointment, blows, depression, drugs, and everything. Meaning, I want to sweeten my life for that spiritual world to serve me. The next stage is when I suddenly start to realize that better I ascend. Yeah. Why roam on this earth? It's better that I ascend and then what? And then you're so inspired by the upper spiritual values of wholeness and perfection and eternity that you don't even want to be in it for your own sake, but you simply want to dissolve in that quality, to be like that property, to be in it. This is truly amazing. So, what turns out is that you're a soul catcher? Me? Yeah. But a person has no soul, there's nothing to catch. Just a small, animate body, that's it. The soul is that state of dissolvement in the upper. Only then do we achieve, attain the soul. And when we say soul now, it's just an inner rudimentary substance of ours which will develop in us. What does it mean to sell idols? If you can clarify that. It means that you believe in these spiritual powers and you somehow try to manipulate them. By it, you can adorn yourself with the help of knowledge, psychology, using all kinds of tricks that we invent in this life and constantly look for. Both governments and organizations and ordinary people, they're all looking for some tricks. How can we make ourselves more comfortable and our life less stressful? This is called to pray to idols. Yeah, these various forces of nature that may help us. Sort of that help will come from abroad, from the spiritual abroad. So it's a state of, I want everything here and now, more money, power, everything. Yes, and this is the level on which Abraham is working and Terach is working. Why is he called a magician or sorcerer? Because this is what we call in our world people that can do something with the help of some external forces. Then happens that flip, Abraham begins smashing idols, he begins telling people that it's all heresy and that they have to believe only in one creator, and people don't want to believe him. And his father reports him to Nimrod, because he broke off from the level of his father, and according to the denial law, he's now against his father. Right, he smashes his idols, right? He's ruining his business. Well, we're not talking about father or son here, but about the two degrees, stages of man's development, that he has outgrown his previous state, he denies it, he breaks away from it, and rises above it. He wants to break free. Yeah. And with his father being against him, and Nimrod, of course, this helps him to break free. Meaning, we have to understand that there is actually nothing evil in the world. If we correctly use all forces in order to advance toward the goal, we see that they're all useful. They all come in the right time, in the right combination between them, they appear in us, and so on. So, Abraham is prosecuted, he's in prison for 10 years, then they try to burn him, and so on, and he successfully goes through it and remains in this country, they as if leave him alone. It's an inner state of a person, how he walks from corner to corner in the oven. He's already above this egoistic hellfire, where his desires are burning to be fulfilled, but he's above it already, he doesn't need it. It burns in him, but he's above it, and therefore the fire can't touch him. And ten years went by, meaning ten complete degrees 
of his spiritual development in prison. Every degree is made up of ten sfirot, ten parts, and he already has to be set free. And all this happens inside of us. Yes, only inside the person. Although in history, all of these dramas, actions, acts, they all took place between different people, characters. In spirituality, all these stages of development take place in one person, in each of us. But on Earth, this takes place in different people in different times. Dear viewers, unfortunately our time's up. Stay with us. Next time we'll talk about Abraham, about the Abraham inside of us, his journey, and how he attains this quality of bestowal. Thank you very much. All the best.